Today we're going to be talking about Escher, but his work was really very mathematical, very precisely planned. Now this is an intriguing slide because I can see Caroline in this slide. Caroline, you should uh, perhaps tell us about this exhibition. This was an absolute pleasure. I was in Madrid in Spain, as you, as you do. I was brought up there, so it's not surprising. And I have a wonderful colleague who is teaches maths at a polytechnic, but he, outside of normal work, he does a lot of maths engagement. He's a mathematician. And he's like, there's an Escher exhibition in town. So we we raced over there and we had a wonderful time. And the thing is, Escher isn't just, we will see some of the things he's famous for here, but he, it's all about it's all about perspective. He must have had an extraordinary brain to be able to actually reproduce ideas that, like the impossible staircase. Have you heard of the impossible staircase? He managed to make a picture of the impossible staircase. And so many I, I different... Kind of yeah images and so okay. much maths in them and you can but see that although the wall's curving and he can actually make it look look real and oh it is yes and what you see here is quite a lot of other people looking out a window a little man sitting on a bench somebody walking along a corridor in an art gallery but then magically uh, the people who created this exhibition were very clever because they created the possibility of you seeing your friend in Escher's picture. I think that's just extraordinary. So what about Escher? Well, he was born right at the end of the 19th century and lived until 1972. So he was a graphic artist and he did a lot of woodcuts, lithographs and mezzotints. He explored space in different dimensions and in particular filling of space by regularly repeating patterns. That's called tessellation in mathematics. He worked with mathematical objects and also mathematical operations, including hyperbolic geometry, impossible objects as Caroline just mentioned, explorations of infinity, reflection and symmetry, as you saw in particular reflection in the sli earlier slide, with perspective, well, of course, all artists work with perspective, but his, he's intrigued by perspective and does a lot of strange things with perspective. Um, he goes in, into rabbit holes with perspective, doesn't he? Right. He really investigates it. Mm, deeply mm. and very successfully. And he does things like um, having creatures crawling out of two dimensions, very definitely in two dimensions, and then suddenly coming out of two dimensions into three dimensions and then back into two dimensions. But of course, all, you're seeing this in a two-dimensional picture, but the three dimensions looks incredibly real. But he's doing this in order to explore the differences and the sort of merging of the different dimensions and what we see in them. And that's without computers, no CGI, just no, exactly. pen and paper. <laughs> and then polyhedra, and we'll look at some of those. Now, he didn't have any formal mathematical training. Apparently, he didn't do terribly well in school, as a lot of other geniuses. That applies to a lot of other really high-performing people. Uh, he, he believed he'd no mathematical ability, but he did his own research into tessellation, which we mentioned earlier, and he interacted with mathematicians, with George Pollier, Penrose, who was at Oxford, uh, Coxeter, who was an Englishman who um, spent most of his uh, career in, in Toronto, Canada, <clears throat> and then the crystallographer, Friedrich Haag. Now, of course, the way things fit together in space is very, very important in crystallography, um, how matter is fitted together. And a, a very common example of that, of course, is the beehive, the, the, um, uh, the, the hexagonal tessellation there. So that's Escher. So let's explore some of his work. Now, 
this picture is uh, one of my very favorites and we've got it hanging in our lounge at home. It's called Night and Day. And he, Escher put recognizable images of living things into tessellations. And he liked to use the theme of metamorphosis or changing of one form to another. And birds transform into fish and fish to frogs, for example. Now here you see the light, the white day, gradually changing into the dark, the black night. And the birds flying across the screen there, across the picture rather, and the um, white ones flying from left to right, and the black ones flying from right to left. And, the and, two... there's, and there's symmetry. If you look carefully at that picture, the two rivers are symmetrical. The, the towns, the, there's two similar, they're not identical, but they're very similar pictures. You can see the symmetry. And it's it, this, this, I could just stare at this picture for hours. There's so much you can, the detail. there's so much you can see in it, isn't there? And, 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 and just thinking about the mind that created this mm -hmm. thought he wasn't good at maths. Oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Caroline, back in the museum, the same exhibition. And you can see here, it's not exactly the, as we saw it in the day and night, because we've got mirrors now, like the um, Hall of Mirrors at Versailles, parallel mirrors that are creating many, many images and images of images to give these birds in 3D space. And you've got them, if you look, they are reversed. So the white birds are, if you look, go back along a line flying towards you and then the next one's flying away from you and the next one behind that is flying towards you again. It's hard as you to see, see with Caroline as well. Can yeah, you, you can see, see that. Yeah, it's hard to see with the line of birds at the top there, but you can see it with me. And then if you look down to the right, you can see a bird flying towards you and above that. So if you look at the reflection that's to that's that way, that so way, this, that's that, that way, be, behind me, that way. There's the, the one lower down that's that's flying towards me and the one next one up is flying away from me. Yes, and it, it's definitely not Escher, but it, this is created as part of this Escher um, ex exhibition at Madrid. And, uh, and it's the same sort of theme of birds repeated. And here you see it again, the same display and repeated again by reflections. I think that's amazing. It was, it was, if you ever get a chance to see the Escher exhibition, please go. It travels around the world, go. Well, there are, you can also go to um, Holland and the, the permanent museum there with a lot of exhibits, not as sort of fanciful as this, but much more detail about his work and showing you his various woodcuts and stages at which, you know, the, of the woodcut, the way he made his, um, his, his uh, woodcuts. Now here, this isn't Escher. It, this is a compilation inspired by Escher with Caroline at the back there. And this the front there, that fishes, we'll see that again. That's a bit of Escher. Um, but he didn't do works like this with sort of different, you know, big changes from one to another um, in this way. At least uh, I could be wrong, but it, I, 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 maybe I'm wrong. But it, it seems to me it's more something like the, like the Mirrors one inspired by Escher. Now here we get on to some of the real Escher. And this is the this is what Esh inspired Escher as, as opposed to inspired by Escher. It was the other way around what we're seeing here. Yes, well, as a young man, Escher went and worked in Italy for a few years and he took a trip to Spain. I rather imagine him as a young a bit romantic really as a young backpacker like young people do in their gap years now but he would have had all his artists um stuff with him so he could do his painting and and his work and yeah, maybe so, he traveled in style and had his own carriage and 
Yeah, I don't think so. (laughs) No, (laughs) I don't think he was a rich uh, aristocrat from Northern Europe. No, he he was inspired at Alhambra, which is a Moorish palace in Granada in Spain. The uh, Muslims didn't believe in depicting the human form in any way in art and uh, even living creatures. So theirs was entirely abstract art. And you see on the left, a designer's Alhambra, um, which is uh, based on <clears throat> uh, threefold symmetry, um, based on triangles, but you can see how those shapes are all fitted together. And in the middle there, that's just a sketch from Escher's notebook, which was a study of the design on the left. <clears throat> and then a few years later, he made that into not just a design, but an actual art um, a production, uh, which he called Hexagonal Tessellation. And it's and it, the subtitle is The Study of Regular Division of the Plane with Reptiles. Now you can see three, if you take where, for example, the three points of rotational symmetry, where you get three of the um the, oh, the three meeting, really intertwined. They meet at a point and yeah. then the green rotates into the red, rotates into the um the lighter cream colored one so you can rotating about the, the diagram about a point now that's threefold right, okay. rotational symmetry so yeah. it is essentially a development of the symmetries we, we talk about symmetry not just in mathematics not just to be reflection but to um we talk we the symmetries uh, plural are all the different sorts of ways in which the the diagram transforms images of one motif or small part of the diagram can be you can imagine them moving around or by reflection to another copy of the same motif so there we have actually i'm glad you pointed that out tony because i hadn't actually noticed that i've seen that in other in other um images but i hadn't noticed that that's the one place Oh, you got it with the heads as well i was going to say that that where have you got that because with the front legs you don't have that repeated patterns so much well their cheeks but, uh, meet they're, they're, the, they're that's cheeks. what i'm saying it's the heads the cheeks you've got the that with the cheek. three heads yeah and then you've got that with the re- one one of the rear legs and i hadn't noticed that so that that really does help you see the rotational symmetry there hmm. but it's it's just mind-boggling that it it really it just does continue and it's you can look at these things can't you on on and just just uh, keep, yeah, get absorbed keep, in them yeah get yeah and keep noticing different things so at a recent happy mass hour we talked about spirals and introduced the idea of stereographic projection now i'm just going to give you permission here to just sit back and watch the show if, so feel free to jump in but feel free to just watch the show and and just accept what's being said because <laughs> this is one of the areas where i struggle that doesn't mean you will struggle but it's okay to just let it flow over you and just enjoy the concept. Sorry, Tony, go ahead. Well, this is used in um, in map making. So one of the projections that puts the globe, what we have on the earth, our continents and cities and all the rest, onto a, onto a flat map in the atlas is stereographic projection. It's not now the usual one used, but it, is very much the way that mathematicians um, study spherical geometry. Now that is geometry on the surface of the sphere. And you see in Escher's work there called sphere spirals, you can see a um, square grid on that, little squares. They look a bit distorted perhaps because they're on the surface of the sphere, not onto the flat plane. Now, what you see in yellow on that is a spiral on the surface of the sphere. But what it maps, it's a mapping um, from, considers a mapping from the sphere to the plane or from the plane to the sphere. What it is, is a mapping of a spiral in the plane, okay, which is the same width everywhere. 
no so if it was if it was not on a sphere would it just be a like a cylindrical spiral yes okay so, so it's the equivalent you, equivalent i mean i don't even know what language to use here is it the equivalent of, like a, a, a spherical equivalent of a spiral a spiral in if it's just a, a cylinder was that you that's not euclidean is it it's well just, that no it is actually because is. if you imagine taking the um oh, you label. can flatten you can flatten a spiral you can flatten a cylinder so it is yes Euclidean. yes okay yes, yes so um so but this is not um between a cylinder uh, this projection is not here it's no. not between a cylinder and um the plane it's between a, a, a sphere and the plane mm -hmm. and yeah and you see the, the diagram in the middle, no down, is showing you that the, the lines go from the North Pole and they project the points on the sphere to, I mean, when I say project, I mean, it's the point P on the sphere has an image P dashed on the plane, okay? And uh, all the points of the sphere have got images in the plane. And the center of the sphere, O, is its image is the South Pole. And imagine a map on the, imagine the Earth, on, imagine the Earth with the UK where we are, or South Africa where some people listening to this are, or wherever you are on the Earth, then y your town would be, would be mapped onto the, uh, the flat map by a stereographic projection like this and it's another thought is where does the north pole map to it's different from every other point and it's the, the the one of the this is where the thinking if i if i'm correct in what i'm thinking here this is where a mathematician has no limits there's a clue <laughs> for you <laughs> an engineer which is what i am you're like well that's just pointless it's not possible so there's no point let's make it as accurate as we possibly can within specifications within certain tolerance and within that we're done <laughs> not a mathematician mathematician we can travel to infinity in our minds well everybody can i mean i'm not a real mathematician i'm just a teacher but no um, in math with mathematics everyone can fly to infinity like space fiction but it's not it's something else it, can we just go back to that for one second tony because because it, it was it just i found it it is fascinating that from the, that north point you literally cover an infinite 2d plane as in a 2d plane that never ends because the the angle that from the north pole is actually parallel well it's not i don't know if it's parallel well i suppose it is parallel isn't it so that's that's not a 2d plane that's messing with my head again but it's it, it it just keeps the angle keeps getting closer and closer to 90 degrees so that it's extending just to infinity literally and so to project one sphere, you can project it across an infinite 2D plane, which I, I just think that's, I, I, I really like that. I, well, I'm quite Caroline, happy to how about, and absorb that. How about this, Caroline? You have an infinite flat piece of paper. Uh-oh, yes. And then you wrap it up and it covers the sphere, but in so doing, there are no crinkles in the paper. Mm. <laughs> Isn't yeah, now that that's lovely? messing with my head again. But yes, it's lovely. Yes, <laughs> it's it's a, again a mathematical concept which is there is real, as in it's mathematically true. It's and and the thing is, it's true. It's infinite, and then you can actually put it on a sphere that's only this big. <laughs> How? <laughs> How? Because there are infinite amount of points on a sphere. It's it's yeah. And there are yeah, infinite number yeah. of points in the plane, and, it, and there's yeah. a one-to-one -one correspondence between the two. Okay, let's move on to the dodeca, the stellated dodecahedron, no less. Yeah. So it's called a dodecahedron because do means two and deca means ten, so it adds up to twelve. Hedron means well in Greek it means, it means, faces. means faces. Faces. So mm -hmm. this is. 12 faces 
and that's f equals 12 on my slide there. And there are 30 edges and 12 vertices. In a dodecahedron that's not stellated, it is just like a ball with 12, 12 faces are all pentagons and doesn't have the little peaks sticking out. The sculpture there at the University of Twent in um, Holland, I think, um, is um, one of, uh, I don't think Escher actually produced it himself. I think it was produced from his designs um, and cast in some metal there, beautiful thing. Um, but what you see in gravitation on the right is turtles, yellow turtles and blue turtles and green and orange turtles. And each of those little um, sort of pyramids um, on the uh, stellated dodecahedron replaces the turtle shell. And you see the turtles have got no shells, not proper, sh not their original shells. Oh, I thought they were somehow humanoid, and then I thought they were monsters, and then and they're, I mean, they're, they're, they're are actually creepy, aren't they? Yeah, I don't like them. <laughs> <laughs> but it I is wish clever. Teddy bears, but they are clever, definitely clever. <laughs> Yes, and they're poking their heads out of the little trapezoidal doorways. Yeah, I wouldn't want that on my wall. It'd give me nightmares, but it's, it's fascinating. <laughs> and then I put in here a picture of the pentagram. So that shows you what Caroline was describing. The lines there, if you start at one of the outer points and carry on, we imagine drawing that line, you have got five edges that before you get back to your starting point, you've got five edges. And then inside that, you've got a pentagon. And you can put one of these pentagrams, which are the stars, inside it. And inside that, you can put another one. And inside that, you can put another one. And so it and goes guess on. guess what? The engineer has to stop at some point, no matter how fine he can make the he or she, or he, I'm an engineer, what am I talking about? The engineer can make the, 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 the drawing. But the mathematician never needs to stop. It can go on to infinit infinitesimally small. Uh, that's, yeah, I love, I just love that. And just it, let your mind. Infinitely so, large, infinity. Caroline, because that construction Absolutely. can carry on outwards as well as inwards. Wow. Infinitely. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> okay, so you can see what pleasure, obviously, Escher had himself in creating these mathematical images and also gets given to other people. Now we'll move to something else. And that is people think of geometry as the geometry they learnt at school, which is Euclidean geometry, the classical Euclidean geometry. And that's on a flat plane. And there you see it depicted by the middle of those three uh, images, angels and devils. Can you see the black devils? First thing I see is the angels. I live, in the, with, I live with the angels. Yeah. <laughs> But actually, I mean, funnily they enough, could be bats. they could be, we could just call them bats. They don't have to be devils. But in, in the depiction, you can see the arms. They could be bats. We could call them bats. <laughs> if you don't like devils. <laughs> no, I think they're devils, definitely. Yeah. Um, uh, in the circle limit thing, it's the devils I see first. Yeah. The one on the right. The yeah. one on the right. Yeah, the circle limit is if you, yeah. it's, it's the circular depiction of, of, of that. When you say the, circle limit, it's not. It's um. Is that is that the um? Is that the hyperbolic? That, that is. Yes. Okay. That is. But I mean, it, uh, actually, <clears throat> the mind plays tricks because one minute you focus on the angels and the next minute on the devils. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it's um, a nice optical illusion. But it's yeah. but it's it's just the fact that this is where Escher went. He didn't. It wasn't enough to make these incredible. 2D images, he had to then depict them on a sphere and then again in a representation of a mathematics that's it's called hyperbolic, you'll see it in a minute. But if you notice, they get the, 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 
the angels and the devils get on the circle on the right, the angels and the devils get smaller and smaller and smaller as they go out. But mathematically, they're not smaller. Yeah. Isn't it? That is amazing. So we've got three geometries here, all depicting the same tessellation. But the one on the left is on a sphere. On the surface of the sphere, you've got the angels and devils uh, fitting together in this repeating pattern. And that is spherical geometry or, or, or um, elliptic geometry, as it's sometimes called. Then the middle one is, as I said. Just, just for, for those of us that aren't experts at this, is that, does that apply to cones as well, the elliptical geometry? No. No, okay, no. just checking. Um, it, it's, it, it's, it's, well, hmm. it, it's the geometry, as far as I understand it, it's the geometry on the surface of a sphere. Well, okay. not really, even that. Okay, it's, it's a particular sort of geometry with some axioms, which we will explore in a minute. Okay. And one of the models for it is the surface of a sphere. Okay, we'll just okay. leave it at that for now. Thank you. Yeah, that's as I understand well, it. Which is because uh, when you said elliptical, I'm imagining when you do a cross section of a cone where you get an um, elliptical shape. So. That's a good question. That's a good yeah. yes, yes, because you get the various conic sections and mm. and the, the ellipse is set and the hyperbola are both conic sections. Okay. Um, but, uh, so when you come into the mathematics, there's something called elliptic functions and hyperbolic functions, and uh, well, anyway. Basically, the mass is, is 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 translated from one to the other, and the correspondences um, so, are uh, there. The conclusion I come to here is that this man who thought he didn't, he couldn't do mathematics. It's like, oh, what? <laughs> Interpreting <laughs> oh, all these concepts that I'm like, okay, I'm Caroline. I don't think he listed the. I don't think he listed the axioms, and I, I actually don't think. He, he worked with the formulae, not much no, but anyway. he used the concepts to create his art. That's, it doesn't, it, I'm not saying that, you know, he doesn't have to put them on paper. He's represented them physically. Uh, it's just, I just think it's amazing. Right, okay, sorry. Keep going. And the book that I, I took these from is a book that I've had for many years called The Magic of M.C. Escher. Um, published by Thames and Hudson. It is a beautiful book. And so, I, and you can see with the pages, I found those those diagrams in order to compile that. Um, yes, so now, what is this? Just as um, spherical geometry is on the surface of a sphere, one of the models, apart from the the, the, the circle, another model, another surface on which we can think of doing um, hyperbolic geometry is on saddle-shaped surfaces. Now you can see these cooling tires from the power station, the Didcot power station, I think it is. You can see the cooling tires, towers. Um, they're, not, they're not cylinders, they are sort of they've got a, a curve inwards as you go up there's an inward and then an outward curve and as you go if you're on any one point as you go around them you you, you sort of dip down or if dipping down is as you imagine that's a saddle between two hills there in the, in the picture on the left and that's another surface where you which can be a model for or can be the surface on which you can think of hyperbolic geometry playing out. Is it the out. same on my scissor handles? Yes, and on our bodies, we've got a lot of these um, surf, uh, uh, these parts of our bodies, like the surface where between our thumb and our first finger, we can go up the thumb and up the first finger, or we can go down onto the back and have our hand and the front of our hand. So right in that dip, we've got a saddle. So everybody's, yeah, yeah uh, all our, our, lots of saddles everywhere, really, once you start mm. looking for them. And, of mm. course, on a horse. <laughs> I mean, not yeah. on a horse, but what you ride, what you put on the back of a horse. Mm. Okay. So now here's a very geometrical picture. But the horse which, does have that because they do have that. Um, it goes up and down and, and it goes 
along e either side of the horse it goes up to the neck and 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 then it well, goes the, up the, to the rump it yeah up to the, the neck up to the rump and then down on either side so the horse yeah, does have that shape as well yeah yeah so that's the saddle shape saddle surface okay now here you have a mathematical sort of representation um, of the three different geometries. You have what is called positive curvature for elliptic geometry or spherical geometry as it's often called. You have Euclidean geometry which has no curvature, everything's flat. And you have hyperbolic geometry which with negative curvature. Now what we're talking about here is the shortest distance between any two points, which is a straight line, or the technical term for it is geodesic. Okay, that's the shortest distance between two points. And it is what everybody thinks of as a straight line in the Euclidean plane, which is the top of those pictures. Now, on the left with Euclidean, oh, no, sorry, with elliptic geometry, you've got positive curvature. So on the surface of the sphere, the straight line of geodesic is a great circle, like a line of longitude, a part of a line of longitude. Okay. This is a concept that I, I still haven't managed to visualize it. I've, I've kind of seen it and I've done it on a ball. So if you actually draw a line on a ball, it is a curve. And it's, if you look at it from up above, it looks like a straight line. But of course, it, it isn't. It's on a curve. If you look but, at it from the side, it's, it's, it is on an arc. But there is no shorter way of joining those two points apart from drilling through the earth. <laughs> Which, if you have a say an an air an air a balloon, that's going to destroy the balloon. So that's not an option. That's a nice. Way but but, doing but it. you can drill through the through the um, you can drill underground. You but can. then it might get a bit hot. But you wouldn't be on the surface, and the whole point of this geometry is it since stays on the surface. So, okay. yeah, the only way I've, I've been able to visualize it is by just if you're looking from above down onto the sphere, it looks like a straight line. But if you look from the side, it, it isn't. It's an arc of a circle. Well, yes, I bet it, 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 it is. It might not be a circle. It, it, it's, it is a circle. It, it is, is a circle. great circle. It's like a line of longitude. Okay. But if we if we are. Um, mm, if we're thinking of curv uh, curvature as uh, Euclidean eyes see it, we're, we're talking about curvature every time, curved arcs, okay? Or we're talking about zero curvature uh, as in the Euclidean plane. Now, if you look about uh, uh, the hyperbolic geometry on that surface, as you see on the right there, Imagine it as your um, <clears throat> your dip between two hills, but it's cur it, it curves down from front to back and up when you start in the mid middle of the dip and you go to left or right. Now, staying on that surface, your um, your straight line on the surface, which as Caroline says, if you look from above. It looks straight in the Euclidean sense, is from, seen from the side, it's a curve. But that's what we call negative curvature. I just realized something, Tony. This can actually be represented. I can actually make pictures. When we do our, our eventually, it's a really professional video of this. I can do this, all these three represented with bubbles, because you can easily make a sphere with bubbles. You can make a flat <laughs> surface by putting it inside a flat surface. And I can make the hyperbolic shape with bubbles. That would be very nice. Wouldn't it? And, mm, and I have got a, a ball in South Africa that you can you can draw on um, and you can represent these things. You can represent spherical geometry on it nicely. But mm. you can do it with a ping pong ball and a fine pen, you know. Or a balloon. Make a balloon nice and spherical. Well, and you... Okay, okay, um, you can. Um, 
uh, we'll try it sometime. Mm. So, so now we'll come on to our circles. So imagine standing at the North Pole and you go, you, you, you go half a, a unit, half a meter or something in every direction and mark the points around you that's all half a meter away from the North Pole. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that will be a circle on the surface of the earth. You can do it mm -hmm. on a balloon or on a ping pong ball. Okay. Okay. Yep. Um, so the center of that circle is the North Pole, and and it's and our circle is half a meter in radius away from the North Pole. Okay, that's the red circle that has the pi figure in the number one. Okay, I'm I'm there. I'm with you. I'm on the North Pole with you. Now, if you draw a circle with diameter one on the flat plane, then the, the distance all the way around, which we call the circumference, is pi. And that's how pi is defined. It's the ratio of the circumference to the diameter of a circle, right? So the length of that circle, the length of that um, curve around the edge, the distance around the edge of the flat circle is pi. On the sphere, it's less than pi. Yeah, and you can see why, because to make the shape, you have to be inside, to make it a straight, a Euclidean straight line, it has to go inside the sphere. So the line outside the sphere is going to be longer. No, shorter. It's less than pi, sorry, shorter. The I'm line exactly. across, no, no, you're confusing, Caroline. I'm, guessing, confusing. I'm, guessing, I'm guessing it wrong. You're confusing the the line through, which is the yes, straight sorry. line, yeah, yeah, with yeah. the line around, yeah. which is the circle. Yeah, no, no, so, yeah, it's going to be more. It's like it's like the the triangle. Yes. yes what is going, going to, be to be more, Caroline? It's the it is the Euclidean circle that's more than the one on the sphere. The s circle on the sphere is shorter. The distance around the circle on the sphere is shorter. Yeah, that's what that's. You know what? I don't know if I said longer or short, but I meant shorter. I don't know what I said, but I meant shorter. Okay. And I know so I know let, why I said it. I know what my mental representation is of it, but I might have it wrong. So let's move to the yeah, hyperbolic geometry. Okay. Now then, imagine at the bottom of the dip there between the two hills, right? Imagine drawing your circle, which are all the joining all the points that are exactly half a meter or half a unit from your center, okay? And what will you get? You'll get a sort of bent sort of circle. Yeah, you're going to have a circle. And it will go uh, on the saddle. It will go down on the sort of flanks of the horse, as it were, and up towards the neck and tail of the horse. And in so doing, the flat circle will have to stretch if it's to go onto the surface of your saddle so if you, if you had a model of that shape which is that you could have a, a um there, there are things you can find that are that shape or make one out of clay or something and then you could put plasticine on to mold it into the actual shape that it would be and, to, and you'd have to make sure it had a, yeah, a circle it, it, it's it, it's actually quite um, you just imagine it, close your eyes and think about it, and mm. I think you'll be able to imagine it, everybody out there. Okay, so the middle pictures there are parallel lines. Now, what you have, one of the Euclid's axioms was that if you have a, a line and you have another point that's not on the line, then there's one and only one parallel line to your given line. All right, so any you can have you have at most two. Uh, uh, well, well you, you're specifying the distance apart. Well, you're specifying a point that's not on your first line, and then there's only one line through that point. Whereas so there, are, there are many lines because they can go no, away. No, there from aren't any lines, from... Caroline. Not in the plane. There are. Oh, there's only for for any given line and a point not on the line. Let's call that. Oh, at P for this point that's not on the line, there's only one line through P parallel to your original line. And now for... Um, right, the, so in other words, you're, you're, you've, you've got a point that isn't 
on it's a, it's a way let's it's somewhere that not on that parallel line there's only one place it goes do, 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 bing. there's only one place where it's going to be where it's going to be parallel to the parallel lines uh, perpendicular to the parallel lines no not perpendicular parallel if you have a line think of a line i'm not yeah i'm not i don't think i've ever understood this when you said it so i won't be the only one so yes please go ahead please think of a line i'm thinking of a line i've got a line i've got and a line close your eyes and think of got a my line. eyes closed i'm thinking of a line on a flat piece of paper it's on right. a flat piece of paper now think of a point that's not on that line okay now you can only draw one parallel line through your away from it point that is parallel to your original line right only um, one yes uh, yes i see it now so i only start i didn't start with two because i'm looking at this image that has two parallel two lines that are parallel to each other so i actually only starting with one i'm starting with one line and i've got to draw a parallel line that runs through point p and there is only one uh, yes on a euclid on a flat euclidean 2d surface yeah, there's only one so, right, so, got you. now yeah. if you then go to the sphere yeah. Okay. And you have a single line. I'm okay, drawing a single line, line on my sphere. And, yeah. And then you take some other point of the sphere, not on. So the lines are not going to coincide. They're not going to be the same line. That would be boring. They're going to be different lines. Your pair of lines are going to be different lines. Okay. Well, I've got a point P that isn't on the original right. line, and, so and I couldn't help myself. I had to complete the circle. My mind just completed the circle on the sphere. Right. So then what you what you've got to so go back to the beginning, if you th visualize this, mm -hmm. you have got a line on the sphere, which is a great circle. Mm -hmm. uh, and you take another somewhere else on the sphere and you, you can't you, every line uh, every other line on the sphere the others will will intersect your great circle in two points there are no parallels on the surface of a sphere See, parallelism I I, I is, doesn't exist parallelism doesn't exist on the surface of a sphere see in my imagination i'm imagining a smaller circle that no no that's it. not a straight that is not a circle caroline you've not got sorry it might be a circle in your head but it's yes. not a straight line we okay. are talking about great circles which are straight okay. lines okay right i'm going to just leave it at that and i mean, i can imagine because okay, so i shouldn't be completing the circle then N uh, you could complete the circle as long as as long as you're always talking about straight lines and straight lines are great circles which cut the sphere if you go through them into two hemispheres now you can do that anywhere right you can cut your sphere into two oh hemispheres. into two hemispheres so it's it's halving it's going to halve the circle yeah the sphere um, it's going to halve this whatever it is those two points the, the the great circle to complete it is going to halve the sphere so if you halve the sphere it's not possible for any any other great circle that halves the, halve the sphere to in not, another way to halve not it, to cut it would not to go through cut. it right i've got it now okay there's, thank you there's no parallels on the surface of a sphere okay i see so the great circle halves is cut cu cu cuts the sphere basically into two hemispheres right so, it's and, it, so it's not possible I, i've got it now i've got it i might have forgotten it tomorrow tony but right now i've got it right so when you go to hyperbolic geometry right there are infinitely many parallels so when you have a straight line in your hyperbolic geometry <laughs> there's always infinitely many lines that are equidistant from it somewhere else in the geometry okay, okay. like you've got to think of parallels as railway lines and the flat surface all right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and and hyperbolic geometry there's no uh, 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 all uh, there's infinitely many parallel lines parallel to a given line okay, okay so let's move on to triangles okay it's pretty well known that if you have any triangle, any shaped triangle, not just an isosceles one as here, the three angles of the triangle add up to 180 degrees. 
Yeah. Okay. Now, in spherical geometry, they add up to more than 180 degrees because of the positive curvature. Yeah. Uh, and in um, hyperbolic geometry, because of this effect of negative curvature, the angles add up to less than 180. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? I think it's yeah. lovely. I think yeah, it's lovely. I, I agree. It's, it's mind-boggling and it's lovely. And I still think it's amazing that Escher was able to create these representations of, of this mathematics without being a mathematician. Now, here's a couple of Escher um, woodcuts um, dating from a little later on in his life, 59 and 64. They're both of the same subject. Okay, they're both fishes. And again, it has got this um, symmetry here where you've got three fishes' noses meeting at a point with the tails between them. Okay, here you have on the left, you have a very strange thing that's not really you. Uh, it's 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 strange because it's uh, uh, really in speaking, it's it's supposed to be on the plane, and the fishes get smaller as they get to the edge. Now, Escher was doing that sort of exploration of infinity and getting gradually smaller and smaller forever and ever towards the edge. He was doing that sort of exploration quite early on in his career, uh, much, much before this, this particular one I've, I've picked out to show. And he then, uh, as, as I understand it, he then met with a mathematician called um, Coxeter, Harold Coxeter, at a, when Coxeter came to a, a conference in Europe. And Costa was intrigued by Escher's work because Coxeter was a geometer, a geometer, one of the leading geometers of his time. And he, he was working in hyperbolic geometry where they use this spherical, uh, not spherical, I don't mean that, they use this circular unit circle as a model of the um, hyperbolic plane. And because you define distance differently in hyperbolic geometry, right, it has a different definition. By the definition of distance in hyperbolic geometry, all those fishes are hyperbolically the same size. And that's what we saw with the circle in that two slides before, which again is... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that is... So that is um, Escher playing with this concept of the limit limit in a square limit and a circle limit. In fact, he did a whole series of, of both of them. This is circle limit three. That is our explanation exploration for today of Escher, but there is so much more. And so we're going to do another another um, happy mass hour on, on Escher, aren't we, Caroline? Yes, thank you for joining us. And um, Tony and myself, happy mass hour. See you next week. Thank you. For greater understanding and enjoyment of mathematics, the Maths Toys YouTube channel is brought to you by AIMSEC and the Aiming High website. In the description, you will find a link to our home learning guide for ages 4 to 18 and a teacher resource pack. If you find this video useful, there is a GoFundMe link in the description to donate to and support AIMSEC. The money goes to bursaries for professional development for teachers in disadvantaged communities around the world. Subscribe, comment and ding the notification bell to make sure you don't miss our latest activities.